Welcome to this e-learning module, which is with regards to sadness, low mood and depression. So in this module, we'll be thinking about how these uh, mood states are on a continuum um, and that where someone is on that continuum really relates to how much their behaviour has changed. So, for example, if they've become more and more withdrawn or or of avoiding more and more things, and also um, how attached they are to unhelpful thinking patterns such as feeling that they are useless or that everything is their fault. This e-learning module is aimed at anyone who is working with children and young people. As we know that um, if we're working with children and young people, that we will come across people who are sad, low in mood and depressed. And even though this uh, module does give lots of practical tips about how to respond to children and young people when they're in these emotional states, it does not comprise a full therapy training. This module might also be helpful to parents of children and young people to think about how they respond when their children are in these emotional states. So we would encourage you to use um, the, the tips that we give in this e-learning module um, to give you the confidence in responding to people when they, they tell you about these, these things. It may also be that these are helpful things for you because we also know as human beings we will all experience sadness, low mood and depression at times. Although uh, none of the uh, content of this module is explicitly distressing, um, if you find that you are affected by the things that are spoken about today, please seek help from colleagues, friends or family members. As you are working through this e-learning, you may find that you need to pause for a moment to do an activity or to read through the slide. If you need to do so, just click pause and then resume when you are ready. So the low mood continuum is a state of mind where we've become more and more attached to certain ways of thinking. So being full of self-criticism, being really focused on our failures um, or looking out for things that um, could potentially go wrong. And our minds are trying to help us out by saying, you know, these things might be a difficulty for you um, and that you might need to respond in some way. But this becomes problematic when we respond in ways that actually make that state of mind worse. So we start withdrawing from things, we start avoiding things. So if we think about how our minds have developed, they've developed to um, try and help us through the challenges of our everyday life but sometimes that can put us on high alert and get us to respond in ways that actually become more and more unhelpful. So if we take a look at this graph we can see that the more and more we focus on um, unhelpful ways of thinking, the more we focus on some of those thoughts of self-criticism or failure, that the more that will affect our behaviour and the more likely we are to experience the feeling of low mood. So our minds can be constantly busy telling us that we are a loser, we're, we're not good enough, we're not doing the right things. And if we continue with thinking these types of thoughts, the likelihood is that we will notice low mood states arising in us more often. One minute mind. So we can start to observe the way our minds work by just taking a minute, a minute to um, think about uh, and notice what's going on in our minds. So just spend a moment to jot down um, the thoughts that you notice over the course of one minute. Now that you've completed that activity, take a look at what you wrote. What do you notice? Was it just a random jumble of thoughts or are you preoccupied with something? Were they profound, life-changing things or do you know what you were having for dinner?
just notice. So we will notice different things between these different mood states, although they are on a continuum. So sadness is a very normal and natural emotion for us to feel. We're responding to something that has happened that has made us feel at a loss. Let's focus for a time on sadness. Other words that we might use to describe this emotional state are lonely, disappointed, grieving, left out, abandoned. Although crying is a primary indicator of sadness, many people have had experiences of being told not to cry and therefore they may inhibit this behaviour. Other things we may notice is a young person holding their head low, not making eye contact, withdrawing from others, speaking quietly and sitting hunched. Anxiety can be closely related to sadness as the young person is trying to avoid further loss, leading to anxious avoidance such as anxiety about social situations or achievement. In responding to someone who is sad, we need to acknowledge the loss and offer soothing to the child or young person. It is important not to give the message that they should not be sad or that their loss is not real. So when we're thinking about responding to someone who's sad, it may be helpful to think about what we would need if we're sad. And we can break this down into a few different points. So people require comfort. They require someone to put an arm around them or a blanket to be put around them, something that, that gives them that sense of being protected from the outside world. People may need us to be really listening to them and offering that empathy and support, listening without judgment and just taking in and understanding what that person is expressing. We can offer activities that are soothing so that person can soothe themselves. They say things like a warm drink, um, having putting some hand cream on, anything that just soothes that person and leaves them feeling more cared for. And finally, we require compassion when we are feeling sad. That compassion that says, you know, it makes sense that you feel sad and this is just a moment of suffering and these things will move on. So this might be a good time to uh, watch a video around how we can become more self-compassionate. So if you take this web address and put it into your browser, you can watch a video that can help guide you through the steps of self-compassion. So now let's take a look at what may indicate that someone's experiencing low mood. So because low mood is often an indicator that someone has been stressed over a period of time, that they're facing a problem that they're not sure how to solve, people can become quite tired and irritable. They may, um, again, wish to withdraw from other people and stop doing some of their ordinary activities. So when we're thinking about how we might want to respond to someone who is experiencing low mood, we need to offer them all those same things as if they were feeling sad, those, that comfort, the compassion, the empathy and the listening. And it may also be helpful to think with them about how do you solve this problem that is causing them to feel low over a period of time? And if we think about what would be unhelpful, either minimising that person's experience or just telling them to cheer up, telling them it could be worse, could really invalidate that person's experience. And so looking closely with them at what's, what's going on and trying to understand as best you can is a much more effective response. So one of the things that can be really helpful when we're responding to people who are experiencing low mood is to offer what we call them validation. And this is where we let them know that it makes perfect sense that they should be feeling the way they do, given the circumstances that they're in. So if we think about how we might go about do, doing that, the first thing is we need to be really quite present. We need to be there completely listening to that child telling us what's going on for them. 
The second thing that we can do is to try and really accurately reflect what we're hearing. So really trying to understand what's going on and letting the person know that we've heard that. So something like, I can hear that over time you've become really stressed about the outcome of your exams. Sometimes a young person will really struggle to express exactly how they're feeling. And this is where we can validate through reading someone's behaviour. Saying things like, I wonder whether you're feeling really sad about this, or I wonder whether this is really stressing you out, can be very validating. And then we can also show validation of that situation, showing that you really understand why it is that they feel that way. I can really see that. I can really see how being uncertain about the outcome of your exams would cause you a lot of stress. It also can be quite validating to show understanding of that person's behaviour. So things like, I can see why you would stop going out if you felt like your friends didn't want to be with you. So once we've really understood the situation that is leading to the low mood, it can be helpful to start supporting that young person or child to problem solve. And there are several steps that can be helpful for us to think about when we're supporting someone to do this. So firstly, it is very important that we're clear on what the problem is and that we're not just assuming that we understand the problem. So ask lots of questions. Anything that you don't understand, try and clarify for the young person. We can then think about solutions. And in this stage, we can generate as many solutions as possible, not just sticking with the things that first come to mind or whatever you would do in that situation, but really trying to draw on lots of different ideas. Once you have a list of solutions, you can then think about the pros and cons of each of those, whether each one of those solutions would work in this situation, and try and select one that you think that it would be helpful to give a go. So once we have chosen one solution to focus on, we can look a bit more carefully at those pros and cons. We can really look into what might be helpful and unhelpful about this chosen solution and troubleshoot any of those things that we think might be really hard. Once we've struck on the solution and this is the one that we're going to try, we need to make a really good plan around what we're going to do, making it as specific as possible, making sure that we know when we're going to do this, how we might change the solution if certain situations come up. But really having a go at thinking ahead and coping ahead with the situation. We all need to build activities and relationships in our lives to maintain a sense of well-being. Low mood leads to low motivation and withdrawal, so it's important to maintain pleasurable, meaningful and social activity to prevent further deterioration in mood. Even if the person does not feel like doing it, just doing it helps to improve mood. So there are six ways that we can think about um, increasing our well-being. The first being connection, the need to be with other people. Then we have self-care, making sure that we're getting enough sleep, eating enough, doing the right amount of exercise. So there's being active. Um, so this is, is having things to do each day and they might include kind of exercise and things like that as well. And then there's giving. We know that when people are able to look outside of their own situation and look towards other people, that that can really help to improve their mood. Then we have being present in this moment. So focusing just on what's happening now, rather than getting caught up in the things that have happened in the past, or the worries that we have about the future. And finally, we have learning. So having a purpose or challenging yourself to do something new. So now we're going to watch a video of Nick explaining how to do an activity schedule.
Hi, I'm Nick White. I'm a clinical psychologist working for Fairman Gosport CAMS. When a young person is low in mood, what we can tend to find happening is that some of the first signs might be withdrawal from activities which are important to them. They may find that they back away from relationships. They may find that they tend to spend more time on their own. This can be something of a defence against something that they may be finding difficult, but the challenge is that over time, this withdrawal can simply serve to make the mood more difficult. They may feel they have no control over what they're doing. They may feel that they're in a difficult situation where nothing they do is really going to influence what happens in the future. When low mood is troubling a young person, it can therefore be incredibly helpful to have the building blocks of an understanding of what their activities are. So when a young person or a child's mood declines, it can be incredibly helpful to sit down with them and think through in more detail what is it they're doing, or perhaps what are they not doing during the day, that may be helpful to make changes to and improve their mood. Structure can be incredibly important to us as human beings and actually when our mood declines the structure also declines. The first step can be completing a diary. This may seem very straightforward and quite simple but actually sitting down with a piece of paper and thinking actually what have I as the young person or what do I notice the young person doing during the day? What what sort of activities are taking place or not taking place? It can be very beneficial to use a structure of, say, hour slots and think about what's taking place in each of those times. You may hear a young person say very consistently, oh, I just feel like I need to do something that's fun. And fun can be good, but after a while, even a fun activity can start to lose its appeal. What we may need to think about is combining together those positive fun activities or enjoyable activities with activities that can give someone a sense of achievement, a sense that they've, they've accomplished something. A starting point can therefore be sitting down with a young person and thinking through with them about, over the past few days, what have you done? What's taken place? Now, commonly young people might say to us, well, I've just been stuck in my room. I've I've just stayed in bed. But through using a a structure, using a diary, agreeing with that young person about how you're going to break up chunks of time, is it half an hour? Is it an hour? Is it morning? Is it afternoon? you might start to notice certain trends, certain patterns that can then be helpful information to think about moving forward. It can be very useful to start to score each activity on a one to 10 scale for enjoyment, for levels of achievement, for the sense to which it achieves other goals as well. For example, the extent to which a young person feels they're socially connecting or participating within their peer group. Over time, you and a young person may therefore be able to develop the look of a week that may feel achievable for the young person, but may also give them a sense that they're starting to engage in activities that are of value to them again. One of the things that can be helpful to consider is whether alongside the achievement or the sense of of positive effect they may get from the activity themselves is whether having a reward may be helpful. What might happen at the end of a day if a young person's been able to build in key activities which are of value to them. What might happen at the end of the week? Over time, what you may notice happening is that an external reward isn't needed at all. What happens is that the internal pleasure or the internal response the young person's experiencing becomes a reward in itself. So I think the key element of this is sitting down, thinking about what the young person values themselves. It doesn't have to be huge. It could start very small, but actually thinking a little bit more about how when mood is affecting us, how we withdraw from what's important to us and building in a return to that one small step at a time can be an incredibly powerful way of starting to help with low mood. So when we're thinking about signs of depression, what might we be seeing? So we would be seeing someone who for a prolonged period of time, certainly for two weeks or more, will have been very much withdrawing from their everyday functioning. They're likely to talk about having lost an enjoyment of things. So that individual is likely to describe a loss of enjoyment in things. They're likely to feel significantly tired and be perhaps talking about finding it hard to concentrate and keep on track with things. There are many symptoms of depression which are outlined on the slide.
So when we're thinking about how to helpfully respond to someone who is experiencing depression, many of the things that we've already talked about in this e-learning module are going to be helpful. People very much still need to be uh, met with compassion and empathy. They still very much need people to support them to think through problem solving and also needing support to make sure that all of those things that we know keep people well remain part of that person's life. So we're going to come back now to those six ways of well-being and really think about how when we're depressed these become even more important but also may be more difficult to access. And this will be because the person's thoughts are telling them that there is no point of doing these things, that it would be hopeless anyway, that it's not going to make any difference. So when we're supporting someone who is experiencing depression, we need to be quite clear about what this is, person is going to do and when they are going to do it. So really scheduling in those activities each day. So there are some things in particular that can be helpful when we're supporting someone who has depression. So the first is to focus a little on purpose. So trying to help them to work out what they really value and what's really important to them. So this may start with very small steps. So for example, if they really value being connected to other people, it may be the step of making a phone call and making a connection again. And then there's thoughtfulness of others. As I mentioned earlier, we know that by taking our attention off of our particular situation right now and towards another person can really help to lift our mood. So this might start with small steps, such as sending someone a text to ask them how they are, or sending them a thoughtful card to let you, them know that you're thinking of them. And finally, gratitude can be really helpful to us. This doesn't mean saying that the situation is okay, but just noticing any small moment in your life where you're thinking, that was okay, I enjoyed that. It could be enjoying the feeling of the sun on your face as you walk out the front door, or it could be enjoying the feeling of having a nice cup of tea. Anything that just takes away from that thought that, it is always bleak and there is never any sunshine. So now we're going to watch a short video of some young people describing what has helped them when they've been feeling sad, low in mood or depressed. I think it has been enormously helpful, but it was definitely something that was really hard to do at the beginning. Um, I think when you do struggle with low mood, there's a lot of self-doubt and a lot of beliefs about yourself so engaging in those kind of behaviours can be really difficult to do. Um, however, I know in my experience as I started to do them more, so like when I started to eat better and kind of a more balanced diet, uh, and I began to kind of show my body, for instance, the appreciation and kind of love it deserved, um, it made me feel better about myself and made me feel, you know, that I was worthwhile and that I had importance in the world. Um, so self-care, I think, is something that is greatly important and is still something that I continue to use daily now. A more gentle activity, so things like yoga or walking, uh, I found the most kind of nurturing to my recovery as it allowed me to kind of connect to other parts of myself, it allowed me to focus on my breathing, for instance, or nature, and it just made me a lot more appreciative for, you know, like the beauty of nature or, you know, the incredible things my body can do. I'm definitely more of an extrovert, so being around people and having that openness and that freedom to speak to people about your difficulties or just being in another person's presence um, was really, really important for me, I think, particularly as. I got nearer the end of my recovery and I started to kind of get more into a normal kind of life again. Um, it was incredibly helpful to kind of just be around people and do normal things with people, like go out with my friends and things like that and just feel a bit more 
normal. Um, I think having goals and purpose was probably one of the biggest uh, contributors to my recovery. I think having those goals both kind of big and little, so for instance like going to college or going to university um, and also the kind of little ones, you know, just to kind of be with my brothers and things like that were both equally as important and they've really kind of motivated me to keep fighting and kind of keep pushing for my recovery. Um, I'd say I think the thoughtfulness of other people has kind of helped me understand that not everybody is out to kind of hurt me or be cruel to me and that there are people out there that see me as important and kind of think I'm worthwhile and think that you know, I kind of had a purpose and significance um, in life, which were kind of things I didn't think I had. Um, so to know that other people felt that about me and to kind of show me that kind of affection, I think was really important in me helping me realize that I, you know, was important. Um, I think gratitude helped me notice kind of the little things and the kind of little perks, I think, that life has, I think, particularly with low mood you just tend to focus I think on all the kind of negative things that happen to you but with gratitude you kind of notice the more positive aspects of living you know just like feeling the sun on your face or you know just something tasty or something I think it just made life seem a lot more bearable which made recovery a lot more significant. The idea of self-harm and suicide can be present for people who are low in mood or depressed. These ideas are an attempt to solve the situation they are in by escaping the situation and their thoughts and feelings. By understanding the problem, working on alternative solutions and eventually unsticking from the self-critical thinking will we'll reduce the urge to escape and solve the problem through self-harm and suicide. The problem with using self-harm as a way of dealing with low mood is that it's suppressing any thoughts and feelings even further. We also know that at this point in young people's lives, they're often already considering what is the point of life? And this can add to some of that suicidal thinking. So there's a four step process that we can use to help people when they are recognizing that they have urges to self-harm or thoughts about suicide. So the first is to validate that this is something that comes up. So we're normalising that this doesn't make them um, abnormal in some way, but that often when people find themselves in a very tricky situation, they're looking for a way out of feeling the way that they do. And we can then validate their distress, really acknowledge the situation with empathy and compassion, letting them know that how they are feeling makes sense. Sitting alongside someone rather than face to face might help them to describe exactly how it is that they are feeling. We can then reframe with the young person. So thinking of the urge to self-harm or thoughts around suicide as their attempt to solve the problem, their attempt to escape from the emotional pain that they're in. And then we can activate them and really encourage them to learn new ways of dealing with their pain in a healthy way, using all of those ways of well-being and all of those things that we've spoken about already in, to redirect their attention towards solving the problem that they have. We can also help to soothe the young person by letting them know that this situation that they're in and the pain that they are experiencing will pass over time. Sometimes people do need more help than their family or friends can offer and we need to seek more specialist help. This may come in the form of GP, youth worker, counsellor or the like. There may need to be a referral to a CAM service. And the help that this person might receive could come in the form of medication or in the form of talking therapy. In this training, we have considered how the experience of sadness, low mood and depression affects people's behaviour. We have explored some ways in which we can helpfully respond to others and ourselves when we notice they are experiencing these mood states. 
In summary, we have learnt that life is challenging and we will all experience pain. Sadness is an inevitable and healthy part of life. Low mood is normal in situations where people are under stress or have had a difficult life event. We will recover when the stress is over or the difficult life event has been processed if we are able to maintain self-care, connection and activity during these times. A person can be said to have depression when they are no longer able to function in some parts of their life due to ongoing unhelpful thinking and low mood that impacts especially on their self-care, sleeping, eating, motivation and concentration. People who experience depression recover through re-establishing self-care, connection, activity, purpose, gratitude and care for others and managing unhelpful thoughts by noticing them and asking, is this helpful to me? Is it taking me closer to the life I want or further away? If a person does not recover from a depressed state over the course of a few weeks, more help can be sought through primary care services or CAMS. These people may be offered talking therapy or medication. So thank you for taking part in this e-learning module I hope that it's been helpful to you and that you've learned some practical tips of how to respond to children and young people. There is a lot more information and resources on the Hampshire CAMS website and I would encourage you to take a look at that to increase your confidence and knowledge about this subject area.